Ladies and gentlemen, let's take our seats. Come in, please, so we can get started. The team is fully assembled. I hope that uh, Governor Visco is also online available. Is that, what about the technical team back there? You have also the line to the governor, hello? Hello, yes? Okay, good. So we can start. So Otmar, over to you. I think everyone has come in. Thank you. Um, the next and last panel is on monetary and fiscal interaction. Uh, I think the pandemic has presented a perfect case for an optimal um, interaction between fiscal and monetary policy. Fiscal policy uh, can be targeted uh, to sectors uh, uh, to compensate uh, the demand and um, limit the damage in certain sectors. And the challenge for monetary policy was mainly uh, to provide a stable financial environment. Uh, before handing over to the panelists, uh, I would like to start with a very few uh, probably provo provocative uh, remarks. Uh, the title could also have been about the policy mix. Uh, so creating the optimal policy mix between fiscal and monetary policy is an old and persistent, always relevant idea. This concept demands coordination between the fiscal authority and the central bank. However, leaving aside the specific problems in the European Union with one central bank and the ECB and 19 national fiscal authorities, coordination raises fundamental questions. Central banks preparing monetary policy decisions will take into account the stance and plan future course of fiscal policy. And fiscal authorities should know the reaction function of the central bank. This mutual knowledge and corresponding information establishes a kind of implicit coordination. This is very different from a commitment in an explicit ex-ante coordination. An independent central bank, to my mind, must not enter into any kind of political negotiation process and in the end commit to a certain course of monetary policy. Experience shows that there is always a high risk that governments, for various reasons, understandable reasons, and from the political side, might not be willing or able to deliver on their commitments, not least due to the fact that the central bank is expected to fulfill its commitments. So without further ado, uh, I would like now uh, to present uh, the three outstanding experts on this panel. Ix Ignazio Visco uh, is governor of the Banca d'Italia uh, and probably the longest serving member of the governing and general council among the longest, uh, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> he is member of many international groups. Uh, only to enumerate them, uh, Ignazio would take too long. Uh, but before and also during uh, his office, uh, he is also is an excellent researcher. He has published uh, a number of outstanding uh, <clears throat> papers, uh, and I'm glad to see him again. We know each other since many, many years. Ignacio, good to see you. Uh, is uh, the San Sebastian behind you uh, in your office? Yeah. Still? So, Philippe Martin is a professor of economics in the Department of Economics at Sciences Po. <clears throat> since the crea creation and was the first chair from 2009-2013. He's also a CPR research fellow. He was appointed as chairman of the Conseil d'Analyse uh, Economique in January uh, 2018 by the French uh, Prime Minister, Philippe the research focuses on international trade and macroeconomics and 
the work. Uh, his, his work is recognized both on the national and international uh, level. Uh, finally, but not least, uh, Harry Dellas uh, is professor and co-director Institute of Policy, Political Economy at the University of Bern. He's a research fellow of the Center of Economic Policy Research, EPR. Uh, he was a visiting scholar to the Federal Reserve of New York, the Federal Reserve of St. Louis, and uh, the Bank of Greece. So he has not only done excellent research, he has also experience in central banking. Uh, now, I hope the connection functions. Uh, Italy is far away. Uh, today, this morning, I've seen that uh, a nar narrow distance does not mean uh, perfect connection. Ignazio, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope uh, Rome and Frankfurt coordinate well enough. <clears throat> now, uh, a good implicit coordination, as you were mentioning, between fiscal and monetary policy has been a key factor at a global level over the last two years. Uh, this uh, has been necessary to contrast the consequences of the pandemic crisis and to support the recovery. And in essentially all countries following uh, the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, governments stepped in to strengthen the health system, to support households income, credit to firms, and uh, fiscal policy everywhere was strongly facilitated by the accommodative monetary policy stance. Uh, in the United States, however, fiscal measures were especially bold. The public debt to GDP ratio rose by 25 percentage points in 2020-2021 to over 130%. In the euro area, instead, the debt ratio increased by 15 percentage points to slightly less, slightly less than 100%, despite a much deeper, much deeper decline of nominal GDP in 2020 and a slower recovery in 2021. Uh, and it was until uh, the dramatic breakup of the Russia-Ukraine war on a steady downward trend. Uh, at the same time, concerns on the impact of structural changes on growth potential led to the launch of the recovery and resilience uh, programs associated with the EU Next Generation Initiative. Now, uh, in the United States, I will go with my first slide, the, uh, all this led to substantial demand pressures. The extraordinary support to households provided by the U.S. fiscal policy is particularly evident when we compare, as it is in the slide, the dynamics of GDP with that of households disposable income. In 2020, just as GDP recorded its sharpest collapse in real terms since the Second World War in the United States, with a decline of minus 3.5%, more or less, real household disposable income instead grew by over 6%, the largest rise since many, many years. In the euro area, uh, on the other hand, the disposable income declined, even though by a much smaller amount, as we see in the slide, uh, than GDP. Uh, and it was a fall in GDP of 6.4 percent and, uh, and a decline in household, household uh, disposable income of uh, more or less close to 1 percent, half, between half and 1 percent. Now, the different dynamics of household disposable income across the two economies translated uh, into very diverse effects on consumer and aggregate demand and consumer price inflation. Uh, next slide, please. In the United States, GDP returned to its pre-crisis trend at the end of last year, and in particular, the goods sector, as we see from the slide, uh, increasingly showed signs of overheating. Even downs, if we can have the, 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 the next slide, I would, I would be glad, and fears of contagion, but, but their growth rate remained relatively contained, as we can see from here. And at the end of 2021, consumption expenditure in this sector was still lower than its modest, modest pre-pandemic trend. Pressures on consumer prices, as we can see from 
the next slide, uh, have been intensifying in the US since the spring of last year, with headline inflation peaking, peaking, uh, I think it is the slide, yes, peaking uh, somehow at uh, close to 8% uh, in February. Uh, core inflation, as you can see from there, played a key role throughout this process, and in April of last year, already it had risen by 3%. Last month, it reached 6.4%, the highest in 40 years. Now, in the uh, euro area, also headline inflation ro rose to 58 close to 6% in February. But energy and food took the lion's share. And uh, as you see from, from here, the, the growth of the core component was more than three percentage points lower, less to 2.7%. Now, the question here is whether we are behind the curve. Uh, and indeed, before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, to understand the economic outlook on both sides of the Atlantic uh, and how the policy mix should have evolved accordingly, we had to look at three key factors. Uh, and uh, the first is uh, related to the developments in the energy market. Uh, oil prices rose gradually but steadily during the last year at the global level from the lows of the most acute phase of the health emergency. On the eve of the war, they were 60% higher than in January 2020 for both the US and, the, and Europe. Next slide, please. Gas prices in the US recorded a similar dynamics, almost doubling with respect to January 2020. However, the cost of European gas, strongly dependent on supply from Russia, really skyrocketed. Between September 2021 and February 2022, as the turmoil from Russia already started to be evident, it averaged at over eight times the value of January 2020. After the outbreak of the war, it was even higher, with a peak of 20 times uh, the level of January 2020, before returning somewhat uh, closer to the previous average in the last few days. It is around 10 times now. This is particularly worrying due to the special role of ga gas in determining retail prices for many uses, of course, not only heating and industrial uses, but also for el electricity at large. Now, for Europe, this is a clear supply shock. Even if at the global level, the general rise of energy prices that has been taking place jointly with the supply bottlenecks obviously also reflects the interplay with the recovery in demand. But in Europe, we have observed the deterioration of the terms of trade and the consequent reduction of the purchasing power of domestic income, so something that still goes on significantly. The question for the euro area uh, now is whether there might have been therefore developing second round effects to compensate these losses. So I think we should consider two other factors, the other two factors. And uh, the second key factor is related to the labor market. Next slide, please. In the US, the growth of nominal wages amounted to more than 4% last summer, nearing 6% in January 2022. In the euro area, instead, the increase in wages still remained around, if not below 2%. This is negotiated wages. If you look at actual earnings, it is a very volatile series, but on average, the trend is similar. It is now uh, a little bit um, above 2%. The substantial slackening that we continue to observe in the intensive margin of labor utilization, if we consider many, many possible indicators, one indicator is, is the hours worked, uh, and uh, the low level of vacancy rates, they both also uh, do not point out so far the possibility of a worryingly persistent acceleration of nominal wages. Obviously, with the current inflation rate, this is something that we have to monitor very closely. We have to avoid the cost of uh, transferring a tax, what is a tax, exogenous tax, into the uh, mechanics of uh, wages and price and price determination. Now, the third factor that uh, I wanted to point out, I understand there has been uh, some debate also about this in previous panels, uh, it, it concerns inflation expectations. 
Next slide. Uh, it seems it seems to, to to me, however, that expectation from at least these kind of data, which is survey data, we also have financial market data, which have to be treated with care, especially now when there are uh, sudden changes in the uh, series that we may observe and the liquidity of the market may be, may be pretty restrained. But uh, if you look at this, this survey data, uh, uh, it seems that in the US, longer term expectations do not show clear signs of the anchoring, providing therefore an encouraging perspective for the Fed uh, of bringing actual inflation down without substantial surprising and a new surprising and abrupt changes in the monetary stance, which could clearly trigger a recession. In the euro area, the process of gradual re-anchoring of longer term expectations from the laws which we have observed in the last few years uh, is being completed even if a non-negligible percentage of analysts, as you can see from there, continues to predict inflation to be somewhat below our 2% symmetric target in five years' time. Now, given these developments, which in the uh, United States, uh, the Federal Open Market Committee, uh, to, 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 to account for them, uh, ended up... Uh, substantially uh, deciding to quickly reduce uh, asset purchases and implement a communication uh, campaign in order to prepare the general public for the lift off of rates, which just started yesterday. In, in, in the euro area, instead, a gradual normalization of monetary policy was deemed to be the most appropriate stance. And from the evidence that uh, I have briefly summarized in these slides, uh, and this is the last one, uh, I strongly believe that monetary policy in the euro area has not been behind the curve. Indeed, I would venture to say that the re-anchoring of inflation expectations after a rather long period during which the ECB has successfully countered what I think were really material deflationary risks uh, also bears witness to the success of the new monetary policy strategy completed in July of last year. There is certainly, I think, a good reason to believe that given the wage prospects and the state of expectations, and this is a crucial given, headline inflation will progressively converge to 2% as the serious disturbances generated by the dramatic evolution of the Russian-Ukraine war fade away. Now, after the war has started, uh, is this conviction going to change? Well, we must indeed acknowledge that the rise in energy prices, which is accompanied by uh, increases also in the prices of other commodities, as we, as we understand, uh, and most prominently, but not only food, is a clear and unexpected supply side shock. Uh, this may last for some time with possible important negative effects on aggregate demand and in turn on the medium term inflation outlook. While, while both monetary and fiscal policy may in principle counter the inflationary effects of energy costs, only the latter is able, only fiscal policy is able to uh, directly influence uh, these costs, also offsetting the loss in disposable income at least in part and to the extent that it does not jeopardize debt sustainability and limiting their impact on the economy. Uh, this said, uh, the main response to what is essentially a tax cannot come from monetary policy, especially in the absence of a wage price loop and with inflation expectations re-anchoring to the central bank's objective. I will go back to this later. In any case, this reinforces the need of swiftly designing a strategy uh, especially at the European level, that while in the short run helps to curb the unjustified spike in energy and gas prices, I, I personally think, even if I remember very, very well the problems of price controls many, many years ago in a similar uh, occasion uh, when there was another kind of tax on oil this time, uh, I think personally that uh, to have a short period of uh, uh, administered prices would not be a bad idea. Uh, but uh, also, obviously, uh, there is a need of, to support incomes of those who are most affected. 
Uh, however, on a more structural basis, uh, we have to really to realize, and, the, and this at the European level is crucial, uh, that uh, energy source diversification is strongly needed, uh, as well as storage and the identification of common resources for managing energy crisis. There was a lot of uh, articles and books written in the 70s and 80s trying to deal with the issues of raw materials, spikes and so on, uh, and shortages. It is a challenge that today goes hand in hand with the one posed by climate change. Now, the Russian invasion of Ukraine implies some very important changes in the economic outlook of the euro area and in the assessment of risks. Further increases of energy prices will not only affect the short-term inflation outlook, but will also determine, as I've said, significant headwinds to domestic demand. While the announced sanctions and the sharp deterioration of Russia's economic conditions will weaken external demand and cause potential risks to financial stability. What uh, to us we really have to consider uh, is that household and business confidence may be strongly shaken. And this would result in a worsening of the prospects for GDP growth and in turn greater downside pressures to inflation in the medium term, which could follow the large price increases observed so far and perhaps still to come over the rest of the year. Now, the ECB staff came out with a new baseline projections, which we used and discussed at length during the last meeting of the Governing Council of the ECB. This was built on the assumption of the disruptions to energy su supplies and the impacts on confidence are only temporary, while global supply chains are not significantly affected. And at the end, we, we had the projection that was cutting the previous ones by somehow half a percent of a point for GDP this year, very little next year, and then back, back to normal. And, uh, and inflation was set to average uh, above 5% this year and then go down to two, close around 2% already from next year. Now, the outlook, I think, has severely worsened since the cutoff date used in those projections. Looking beyond the short-term volatility of oil and gas prices, whose fluctuations clearly depend on diplomatic advances and the unfolding of conflict uh, and so on, there are grounds to believe that these projections are already, already obsolete, outdated. I think households will be hard hit by the energy and food price shock, and particularly those in the lower income brackets, which have a high propensity to consume and low saving buffers. The ones in better conditions will face elevated uncertainty, and the standard answer to that, at least in the textbook I know, is, is some higher propensity precautionary savings, not the use of the accumulated savings to cope with lower incomes. Now, the dramatic increase in uncertainty also suggests that in the current circumstances we have to do without really point estimates, uh, point projections, and try to have scenario analysis. It is, it is very complicated. And the war also uh, very much increases the tail risks. Um, one of them is clearly gas shortages. Assume that we do not import gas anymore from Russia. Well, this will have uh, will be a major hit for our economy, and we have to compensate in difficult, in different ways. And uh, uh, over time, we may succeed, but clearly, this will be something that has to be taken into account with rationing and so on. And production will be disrupted to that. But market integration also, as well as multilateral cooperation, risk being very much affected. We are living through a profound very sad, uh, as well as dramatic, uh, watershed. The, and this may lead to economic patterns that are now difficult to define. And in this respect, I believe that the public discussion that has followed the ECB Governing Council latest decision about the perceived prevalence of a hawkish tone lacks focus. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, this distinction between hoax and doves is, is, I think, nonsense. Uh, if there is a risk of deflation and you want to counter that, you are not a dove. Uh, and obviously, if there is a risk of inflation that is fueled by indexation and the other, you have to intervene. 
but uh, but it doesn't depend whether you are hoax or or, or, or at all. You have to be some that somebody who thinks well by acknowledging the situation of high Nightian uncertainty, which is the one we are facing now. We have decided that uh, we should not commit our actions beyond the very short term. Even proceeding along the path of gradual monetary policy normalization uh, to get out from this uh, enormous, enormous, uh, um, and favorable uh, condition, favorable financing conditions, and almost uh, efforts that we made, and favorable financial conditions that we delivered in the last in the last few years. Even proceeding along the path of gradual normalizing our policy, we choose to keep all our options open, as it is clear that we are not yet in a position to fully assess the economic implications of what is an unprecedented situation, at least in. Uh, in my lifetime, and uh, and I suppose also in Otmar, even if a little bit, he, unfortunately, he, he has seen that. Um, now, uh, on one hand, second round effects on nominal wages and longer term inflation expectations have to be closely monitored. On the other, the effects on real activity and incomes and through them on aggregate demand and price developments have also to be obviously taken into account. Our contribution, the contribution of the Council and the responsibility in such difficult times is not to increase but instead to reduce uncertainty. To this end, another aspect that plays a very important role is the commitment that with our man within our mandate and under stress conditions, flexibility will remain an element of monetary policy. Indeed, guaranteeing a smooth functioning of financial markets and assessing the implications of our decisions on financial conditions with great care are necessary conditions to uh, deliver on our medium-term price stability mandate. I will uh, just conclude with uh, a few observations on, uh, on fiscal policy. Our decisions remain intertwined with those of the fiscal authorities. Uh, I agree, it is implicit coordination, is not uh, a, a, an exchange, a policy exchange. Uh, as I mentioned, the supply-side shock should be tackled predominantly by fiscal policy, which could shield the economy by diminishing the transmission of price increases from energy to consumer goods and limiting the loss in disposable income. The de facto coordination between fiscal and monetary policy which has worked well in the last two years to counteract and contain the economic and financial consequences of the pandemic crisis, I think is still necessary. I believe that if fiscal policy is effective in attenuating the impact on households and businesses of the incredible leap in energy prices, and if monetary policy proceeds with caution, absent there is a third actor there, the second round effects, that I already mentioned, we will be able to successfully continue the gradual normalization of monetary policy uh, that has started at the end of last year. Fiscal policy, however, should remain focused on increasing growth potential, and this uh, next generation EU is, is a good idea. At the end, uh, we need really to uh, face uh, the structural changes which are on which we are being behind. That is where we have been behind the curve, of course. Uh, and um, but at the same time, fiscal policy has to preserve the good health of public work balances. I'm finishing. Two closely interconnected objectives. The relevance of the former is magnified by the challenges that will char characterize the next decade, including the inevitable normalization of the growth rate of the economy and of short and long term rates, as well as the aging of population. And with respect to the second objective, that of uh, keeping good health, in good health public, fun, uh, uh, public balances, uh, countries with high public debts will have necessary to progressively improve their primary balance. To conclude, of course, uh, an immediate end to the Russian aggression to Ukraine could quickly put an end to the escalation of energy prices, bringing inflation down and helping us to put the economy back on a growth path. Uh, in expressing solidarity with the Ukrainian people, I believe I speak for everyone, and this has been probably said already many times, uh, when uh, I say that peace 
is the result we all hope for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Otla. Thank you. Thank you, Ignacio, especially for the first 15 minutes. Uh, so... <laughs> it was 15 to 20. <laughs> that was my instruction. Philip, please start. Okay, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation. Uh, so, um, um, at this stage of the... Oops, maybe... Yeah, great. Um, I guess at this stage of the conference, we, uh, we understand uh, that we are in a very difficult juncture in the Eurozone with simultaneous uh, shocks. And, and one message I, I want to convey in, in my talk, there will be many, but uh, the one uh, I, I want to convey, especially after this, uh, this intervention, is that we need better explicit uh, uh, coordination between fiscal and, and, and monetary uh, policy. Uh, which has not been uh, a feature of the, uh, the, of the Eurozone for, uh, for, since, the, since the beginning. So indeed, this is not only about uh, uh, the, the, the situation right now with uh, the negative supply shock and an uncertainty shock. I think we have challenges uh, with uh, the new uh, war situation, but these challenges resonate with the more long-term issues on, uh, which were already uh, present before COVID and before Ukraine. And here again, I'm thinking about coordination, but also about the issue of, uh, of, uh, of debt sustainability and fiscal rules, which I'll talk more about. Um, let me go very fast on this because I understand we're a bit, uh, a bit late and, and we've said already quite a bit of things on you know, the issue of persistent inflation coming from, uh, uh, from the uh, supply shock. I just want to highlight that it's, uh, it, that it's very important that we also understand that it's also a huge uncertainty shock and the confidence uh, shock for, uh, for consumers. I was looking at uh, the data from, uh, from France from yesterday on confidence of, of households, and clearly it went down very much. So, so we, uh, we, we also have not only a supply shock, but also a, a demand shock, uh, which, is clearly, uh, which is clearly coming. Um, so in terms of policy response, we've seen last week the ECB uh, with an acceleration of uh, monetary normalization and tightening. It's a first mover. Now, where I'm, I'm a bit um, and at ease is that we don't know yet what is going to be the fiscal uh, side response. We all, all, always uh, think that it takes a bit more, uh, long t longer time to, to, to clarify what will be the fiscal reaction at the national, gov uh, national government level and what will be the fiscal reaction at the EU level Will there be another uh, uh, um, uh, EU level type of uh, spending and, and debt, etc.? We don't know yet. So there's a lot of uncertainty also on the on the fiscal side. I would, uh, uh, and that's my only judgment on what has been done last week. I would say that the normal normalization, gradual normalization of monetary policy, is certainly the right thing to do. Uh, in terms of may, it makes sense uh, given the high inflation and the risk of de-anchoring of expectation. But I think its success is very much uh, depending on uh, some sort of coordination with, uh, with fiscal policy uh, and fiscal absorption uh, of the shocks. So we know there's an absence of policy coordination in the Eurozone. I understand that in this room this is a welcome equilibrium, but I don't share this, uh, I don't share this view. Uh, there's a strict disconnect of fiscal and monetary policy, and I don't think it has uh, passed well the test of time. Indeed, as it was said before, in some sense, there was implicit coordination during COVID. Uh, the ECB intervened and, and lowered the cost of borrowing for governments to be able to better absorb the, the shock. But with this juncture uh, of the, the supply shocks and the uncertainty shock and the demand shock, I think we need more explicit coordination. I think, uh, in, indeed, Elga Barch has uh, 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 written some very interesting with co authors uh, 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 proposals on, on, on that side. Clearly, and, and here I look at, at you, yes, the independence of the ECB must not be infringed. There's no binding commitment uh, uh, of the ECB, of course, but we can think creatively of soft coordination arrangements, such as a dedicated board or of, uh, a European uh, semester process. Fiscal policy, so indeed, and this has been said before, 
we know certainly that the low-income uh, uh, households are going to be the ones that are going to be hit more uh, by, uh, by the uh, increase in energy prices. We looked at this at the Council of Economic Analysis of looking at uh, 300,000 uh, bank accounts. What we found is that basically, like in all, all other countries, uh, the aggregate excess saving during the COVID is very large, so there is this pot of money in some sense which is available, but it's very unequally distributed. Basically, today, even uh, we looked at the data until February, so before, uh, before the war, the excess saving is still continues to increase for top decile households. It is starting to be reduced modestly, so consuming a little bit of this saving for median households, but uh, it was entirely spent. In fact, there was very little uh, excess saving for the bottom design, and it's basically, there's no cushion for, for, for the bottom design. Uh, so I think in some sense, the, the high income households can use accumulated saving. That's not where fiscal policy and fiscal transfers uh, should, uh, should go. But I think that low income households will require uh, targeted transfers. And this will be important for the political acceptance of the decisions we'll make in terms of what's going to happen in, uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. So in France, just to take my own country, we uh, had a lot of lump sum transfers, uh, some price regulations, some price freeze, I'll come back to this. They were certainly too wide, not targeted enough, they were too expensive and, and certainly too inefficient. Um, uh, and, and from that point of view, so, so, but I cannot at the same time not mention that the inflation rate in France is lower than in the rest of the, in the, rest of the Eurozone. Um, so uh, do these transfers are going to make the uh, life of the ECB more difficult in generating inflation where we already have inflation? So here I just want to show you uh, some, uh, some work that has been done uh, at the Council of Economic Analysis on looking at the impact. Here we have data from, uh, from, Gener uh, from, uh, from Germany where we extend the narrative data on Germany on, on tax cuts, uh, on the impact of tax, uh, tax cuts of inflation. As you know, um, these multipliers typically look at what is happening on GDP, much less on, on inflation. Okay, so what, uh, what is found here is, yes, there is an impact of these transfers here in terms, in the, in the, in the, in the form of a, of a tax cut uh, on, on inflation, but it's a relatively moderate, uh, moderate impact. Uh, fiscal policy, so targeted uh, fiscal transfers, uh, more controversial. So indeed, uh, I think we're going to need more targeted uh, uh, rebates, potentially on energy bills for low-income households. Uh, plus, and, and that's going to be difficult technically, but there are proposals right now being uh, looked at in, uh, in, uh, in, in France, for example, with two households with energy intensive equipment. Um, I, I think we need to be a bit open to, to new ideas and potentially to be financed, uh, this type of transfers to be financed by an exceptional tax on the profits of energy groups, which you know is, is, are super high today. Um, also, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, so I would not go as far as, uh, as um, Governor Visco proposed in terms of freezing uh, uh, prices, but I think targeted price rebates may have an impact on inflation and may have an impact on inflation expectations. Of course, it will have an, ineff uh, an efficiency impact, but at that stage, uh, which is super difficult, I think we need to think about the uh, trade-off between inefficiency, which are triangles, and I would say I'm not sure they are super large at that stage, and the macroeconomic externalities in terms in particular of, of, of inflation. Uh, we know that we're going to have large public investments to come in terms of military, energy, renewables, resilience, and that I think clearly needs to accelerate because that's the, the, that's the way to go in terms of uh, improving the supply side. How to manage well and finance these investments? Let me be clear. I'm not completely sure I trust governments to do that well, so uh, as much as possible, some private sector, uh, some pri private sector in involvement. Um, so the next part is, is then uh, how do we uh, change the fiscal framework uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to be consistent with this new high investment phase? So 
Here there's uh, several papers and I've contributed to, to, to some of them on, on some uh, reforms of some proposals from, uh, from fiscal rules. So let me just say one word on one paper I, I wrote with Jean Pisani Ferry and, and Xavier Rago on, on fiscal rules. So what we're proposing there is to say that given the situation, especially uh, exiting uh, the, COVID, uh, uh, the COVID crisis where we have very uh, uh, high heterogeneity in terms of debt levels, we need country-specific assessment of the debt sustainability. So as Blanchard and some other uh, economists, we, we put at the core of the reform of fiscal rules this issue of debt sustainability to define some country-specific uh, uh, debt targets, which are multi-year, here five-year, but it could be different. Uh, and, and, and here we insist on the fact that the sustainability of debt, uh, public debt, is the key collateral damage that we have to take into account when we think of fiscal rules. That's, that's basically the, 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 the key negative externality, and that's where we should concentrate rather than on the 3% or 60% uh, uh, types of rules. Uh, and, and, and this uh, uh, debt sustainability analysis depends on on, on parameters that, uh, that I put here, which are extremely different from one country to, to another. So having only a uniform rule is clearly not going to work from that point of view. There's the whole issue, and in some sense, it's related to the, the, the latest panel on, on taking into account uh, the issue of uh, climate investments. Um, so there are two ways. Either you take them out uh, from uh, fiscal rules, uh, and uh, uh, that's not our position. Uh, the reason is that if debt sustainability, public debt sustainability is the key issue, you know, whether the debt is to finance uh, uh, expenditures or uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to finance uh, 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 climate investment, it's still debt and it still comes in addition of, of a, I mean, it still creates a problem in terms of debt sustainability. So our uh, preferred solution is to take into account the time profile of climate investment. Basically, we know we'll have to make big investments in, in climate um, and we don't want to create incentives through the rules where, and there are the present rules give these, in, these incentives to basically put uh, in the future, in the far future, these, these investments. So that's where we need some uh, debt sustainability analysis that takes into account uh, the time profile of investments and in some sense to give incentives to make them rather uh, uh, in the short term rather than wait in the long term. Same thing in terms of investments, in terms of uh, uh, investment uh, for, for on the supply side, other supply side forms of investment um, and reforms also in terms of pensions, for example. Um, let me finish with um, uh, the uh, last item in some sense on, on the relation between uh, monetary policy and, 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 and fiscal policy, which is, uh, or debt, which is the financial fragmentation risk. Uh, so clearly, I, 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 I know we're repeating, as many economists have been repeating this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this concern, we know it's difficult to differentiate between two types of uh, uh, debt crisis or uh, fragmentation problems like spread crisis, which are due to redomination risk and multiple equilibria, self-fulfilling expectations, and on the other side, uh, uh, spread crisis due to fundamentals. Um, it seems to me that it's clear that the ECB should uh, uh, intervene in number one, but not number two. We know it's super difficult to differentiate between the two, but you know, the ECB uh, job is not easy, so it's a difficult job, we know that. Um, and I think it's important because uh, to remember, and here uh, uh, I just want to, to highlight uh, uh, what is called sometimes the fiscal monetary channel. We, we talked about it in a paper with, uh, with Thomas, uh, Thomas Philippon, that in the case where you have spreads increasing, uh, what happened in 2010, 2012 is that it increased tremendously and due to the self-fulfilling expectation mechanisms, uh, to too tight monetary policy, too tight fiscal policy, uh, and, and that, uh, I think, at that stage today, we, we, we all uh, think this was a, a big mistake. Now, on that last point, um, in some sense, I am concerned, but all I've heard today uh, from the president, from uh, uh, the board members, 
makes me think that uh, the lessons have been learned and, and that indeed we have to look at this issue, we have to be concerned by, by this issue, but I think at that stage, I want to, to uh, uh, end with maybe an optimistic note. I think we understand better uh, the risks here, and I think that the flexibility that has been highlighted in different interventions on, on that uh, uh, fragmentation risk makes me a bit reassured on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Harris. May I go? Yes? Okay. So, uh, first of all, uh, let me thank Volker for the invitation to participate in this great event, and also to the architect of this event, uh, which is uh, uh, Hotmar. And, and, and I will uh, try to implement a version of that in Switzerland, the SNB and its watchers. I hope that uh, it goes well. And there is an institute, the Karl Brunner Institute. Some of you may have heard of him. Some of you may have met him, uh, a great Swiss economy. Uh, the institute has been named after him and it will be responsible for running this event in Switzerland. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, like everybody else, I'll talk a little bit about the, what I call the immediate problem, which is the current, currently high rate of inflation. And then I'll talk about the bigger concern, which is uh, mission creep and excessive policy activism on the part of policymakers, in particular monetary policymakers. And then I will propose a solution, which may sound a little uh, radical, which will involve tightening policy to uh, deal with the immediate problem, uh, a significant reverse uh, reversal of the increase in the stocks of public liabilities, that is uh, central bank balance sheets as well as public debt, a focus on price stability, and, and a stop to being hyperactive and trying to do, uh, to be the jack of all trades for the central banks. So the current inflation figures do not look very good and don't reflect very well on, on central banks. So the question is, how did it happen? Was it caused by supply shocks or was it caused by government actions, fiscal and monetary policy? And is there anything that the central banks and the fiscal authorities can do about this? Now we've heard a lot about supply shocks. Everybody has been saying that this was the reason for uh, the deterioration uh, on, on the price stability front. And, and nobody doubts that there's been a supply shock. What I doubt is that the current inflation rate can be attributed to supply rather than to demand uh, uh, considerations. And, and I think that uh, what happened uh, represents a vindication of Milton Friedman. Inflation happened because central banks either uh, let it happen or even fueled it. And fiscal policy contributed, especially in the United States, to a grand extent, but the buck should stop here. I mean, monetary policy is the responsibility of the central bank, and inflation is the responsibility of the central bank, so monetary policy, in my view, is the main culprit for the current inflation. Now, you may not believe this, because everybody was talking about, you know, individual commodities, shortages about uh, high cost of energy, etc. But to a macroeconomist, there is a very simple test for determining whether what we are observing now, this is for the United States, I'll show you a similar graph for, for uh, uh, Europe, whether inflation and economic activity are mostly affected by demand or supply shocks. So this is nominal GDP, and look at, so there was a dramatic decline in 1920, and look at what is happening now in the United States. This is nominal GDP growth of 11 to 12 percent. You take out inflation of about 7 percent, this indicates a real growth, real GDP growth of 4 or 5 percent. That's not a situation 
with stagflation. This is not a situation that is driven by supply consideration. It's rather driven by the policy response to the supply shock. So, as you can see, we are you know, way above uh, uh, trend growth in nominal GDP. Now, for the European Union, things look a little better. At least we haven't exceeded the nominal uh, GDP growth that prevailed before, but still we are, as you can see, we have, we have recovered and, and, and real GDP growth is quite substantial. So fine, we've had a supply shock, but it seems that uh, the aggregate demand response to that supply shock has been overwhelming and is responsible for these patterns. How did this happen? Well, I think there was a bit of inflation at deficit, at attention deficit syndrome on the part of monetary, on the part of monetary policy makers. So they were deceived by the data because we have experienced a long period of, sta of stable inflation. So central banks have come to believe that they can control prices. Uh, we theoretical macroeconomists also uh, need to get part of the blame because we have been providing theories to justify monetary policy action that rely on the new Keynesian Phillips curve. And if you look at the empirical estimates of that object, they suggest a super, super flat curve, which means, as Ricardo was talking uh, about earlier, that as long as you anchor long-term inflation expectations, and you do that if you have credibility, then you don't need to worry very much about the impact of aggregate demand or output gaps on inflation. I mean, this coefficient there, this kappa, the Greek kappa, is so low that you can just ignore even massive expansions in aggregate demand as far as price stability. So that was our contribution, the economist's contribution to, to this. And then there is also, I mean, that's uh, uh, psychological, a little bit of an, a, an empire building mentality. There are so many other th cool things to go after, like climate change and income distribution. And, and so if inflation is not there, why, why worry about that? Of course, it's the main mandate, but it's gone. So let's focus on things that look cooler. <clears throat> so what, how do we solve the immediate problem? What, what needs to be done is, is that we need uh, serious monetary and fiscal policy tightening. And it should be far beyond what is being currently advocated for a couple of reasons. One reason is because of the positive overall fiscal implications that this tightening would have. And here I'm gonna <coughs> introduce some novel theoretical arguments uh, based on research that I'm currently doing that suggest that tightening and normalization are, are, are optimal. And also because of the tail risk and uncertainty that Ricardo was talking about. And, and anyway, I'll get to that in a minute. So, the first thing, which is, I guess, fairly well known, the novel part will come in a few minutes, uh, the fiscal implications of inflation management. If the central bank has credibility, then they can choose a slow, a gradual path uh, of response to any shock that hits the economy. Uh, of course, the slower they go, the, the longer the persistence of inflation, but in the long term, there is no problem. And going slow has certain benefits, like you don't impact negatively on economic activity, you allow inflation to persist a little bit, so you shave off some of the real value of debt, so you make the government, the treasury happier, and, and you can issue new short-term debt at, at uh, uh, low rates, as long as you keep interest rates to very low levels. But to me, and this is the tail risk, and this is the big <clears throat> concern that I have, is that, that any failure to contain inflation might create doubts about either the commitment of the bank to inflate to price stability or ability to technically deliver price stability. And that could lead to higher inflation risk premia and higher uncertainty with higher long-term real interest rates and, and higher long-term uh, taxes and, and a lot of other adverse negative uh, effects in the long run. So g given the complexity of getting the optimal adjustment path, I mean, which we can do if you go to Gali's book and you take the equations, you can do this, but this is like for the simplest possible case. I think that prudence 
And by prudence, I mean, you know, taking care of long-term expectations make, of inflation, making sure that these things don't get out of control, dictates erring on the side of being far rather than near sightedness. And to me, when, when, when I hear Powell say that we only increase rates by one quarter point because there is uncertainty, when I hear the ACB saying that we have to do it very gradually because there is uncertainty, I think they ignore the possibility that not acting sufficiently strongly could become a greater source of uncertainty for the economy with deleterious long-term effects. Uh, another reason to tighten up <coughs> is, is, you know, theoretical research suggests that fiscal multipliers at the zero lower bound are very high. So if we raise interest rates, if we move away from that, then we're going to take some of the punch away from fiscal policy. We're going to make it less inflationary, okay? So that would be good news for Build Back Better and other proponents of big problems they have to, to do more, but now the central bank actually limits the inflationary effects of that. And another one, this is also represents a, a, a novel insight here, is that, I mean, traditionally, we, we have been, we have accepted the fact that central banks should be completely obsessed and paranoid about financial market stability and things like that. And they should provide all the liquidity that the market wants. So even the slightest hiccup necessitates a huge response in the financial market necessitates. So my research indicates that this is not really optimal because liquidity is a scarce good. And if you keep it a little scarce, people will be willing to pay something for that in the form of higher prices for government bonds. In other words, keeping liquidity scarce can have significant fiscal implications, which have been ignored so far in the literature, and, and, and my work points out that it can be quantitatively important. This, in addition to the fact that, you know, being hyperactive to uh, uh, hiccups in the financial market uh, creates, you know, moral hazard issues, which by themselves lead to financial instability. Okay? So my view is that that policy has been doing too much or trying to do too much, both on the intensive, excessive responses and extensive, too many things. Uh, and, and we need a little more humility. We need to understand and accept what monetary policy cannot do. We need to actually read Friedman and rediscover Friedman because, you know, I've attended a lot of conferences on monetary policy, etc., and there was nowhere. Friedman's name has never been mentioned, as if inflation has disappeared and inflation, I mean, inflation as a monetary phenomenon has disappeared. And, and the other problem is that, in addition to doing too much, it's that there is a little uh, myopia in policy. So, this is what, you know, Hazlitt has described as the shallow, wisecracks of the type, in the long run, we are all dead. I guess many of you will recognize who is the joker here. And, 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 and to me, a big problem is that they have focused exclusively on flows and completely neglected the effects of those uh, flows on the stocks of liabilities, public debt and, and the balance sheet. And the question is, don't these huge stocks of liabilities hinder the response to inevitable future large shocks when they compromise price stability, uh, when they create expectations of, 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 of high inflation? So this is how the future looks to me, unless, of course, the central banks uh, follow my advice, which is contained in the following page, which is also the last one. I think we need to uh, undertake a rethinking of policy practice. So the central banks keep, need to keep their eye on the ball, okay? Which means that right now they need to tighten up aggressively to put the inflation genie back into the bottle. And, and, and they need to get fit. This means not just current response, but normalized policy. Interest rates, balance sheets, public debt needs to go down to prepare for the next inevitable crisis. Because there will be one. There will be many, actually. They need to focus on price stability and resist mission creep. You know, they just focus too much on financial stability. They focus too, now they have started focusing on things like climate change, income inequality will come 
next, and then I don't know what other things will be added to this. And, and my point is, is, haven't we already seen what happens when the CB take their eye off the ball, which is play stability? So, and the final advice is that they should stop playing or projecting the image of being God. Uh, they seem to like this power, uh, but this has led to the temptation of being excessively activistic. So these are, I, I, I doubt that uh, my advice will be uh, heated, but uh, for the sake of, of useful debates and alternative points of view, I think that uh, they may at least uh, need to be addressed. Thank you very much. Harris, thank you. Um, as we are running out of time, I suggest the following. We now have the three prepared uh, questions. Uh, we collect them, and then I give each panelist five minutes uh, also to cover probable probably comments uh, on uh, the presentations of the colleagues here. It's okay? If it's not okay, I will also proceed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Helga Bartsch. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for uh, this very rich discussion about the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy. And starting from the premise that price stability or inflation is as much uh, as we are while we are this close to the effective lower bound, a monetary as it is a fiscal phenomenon. Uh, and building on some of the comments made by Governor Visco and also by Philippe Martin that uh, central banks have learned their lesson. Um, they are, um, have reviewed uh, their strategy frameworks. I'm wondering uh, when we are going to see uh, the same on the fiscal policy side. And because of the strategic complementarity between monetary and fiscal policy at the current juncture, I am very worried about policy errors that also Ricardo Reyes uh, spoke about earlier today, how they could compound each other um, as uh, due to the interaction and how uh, we are going to avoid this. And this, in my mind, is not just a question of the a macroeconomic, fiscal, and monetary policy stance, but also if we think about a world dominated by supply shifts and one in which we in the future, due to decarbonization, uh, deglobalization, and digitalization, will see a much faster pace of structural changes, how are we going to accommodate those important sectoral shifts, which I do think have uh, important um, implications for the, the monetary policy stance and make a good argument of why you should be looking through some of the inflation overshoots that are resulting from these sectoral policy shifts. But uh, I am a little bit worried when I hear about price controls, um, when I hear about specific uh, transfers, because I think fiscal policy needs to contribute uh, to the sectoral shift in resources that we need to have from both an economic and a security policy point of view going forward. So my question really is, what are the key lessons here uh, for fiscal policy uh, so that fiscal policy is not again one of the reasons why the ECB cannot achieve its primary mandate of price stability? I mean, we have seen the period of lowflation, which I think to a considerable degree uh, was also caused not just by an incomplete fiscal union, but also by premature austerity. So the learning process, I think, needs to be on both sides, not just on the central bank side, but also on the fiscal policy side. So I would be keen to get uh, comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Sylvain Proyer. Yes, I, I guess this, my question goes in the, in the same direction. So the, um, the, learn, the learning process of the, the interaction between monetary policy and fiscal policy, but what's about the learning process of, the, of markets? 
uh, which uh, is key in, the, uh, in this interaction. So there, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, we made a lot of progress in, the, in terms of interaction between fiscal policy and monetary policy at time of the, of the pandemic. But, um, and markets reacted very, very positively to that. But now, uh, when I hear, uh, listen to, to Philippe or, or other speakers before, so what we are, um, what is uh, uh, materializing as scenario is that monetary policy uh, will go uh, from the fast lane to the middle of the road, slowly from the fast lane to the middle of the road, but it will go to the middle of the road, while uh, fiscal policy will have to stay on the fast, fast lane. Uh, for the short term to, uh, to tackle this, uh, this new shock, this new adverse shock we have with Ukraine, but also over the longer term to finance all the investments we need. So what will be the, the, the reaction of the markets in that diverging policy mix and not for the next six months, but for the next two years? So the, 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 my, my two questions uh, are, go to um, Philippe. What makes you uh, so confident uh, that uh, lessons have been learned, and especially from the market side, and um, and, and 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 maybe uh, Aris, uh, are you as confident as Philip on uh, on that? Uh, maybe yeah. And without talking about MMTs and uh, I stop there. Thank you. Uh, last speaker, Katharina Utermöl. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, my question goes obviously in the same direction, but I'm going to make it more to the point. Um, how do you intend to close spreads going forward? So maybe if there are three um, options, one would be you don't want to close them at all, assuming that you had the power to, to take that decision. Um, would you otherwise go for a permanent um, PEP, essentially replacing the pandemic by permanent um, having a sort of safety box uh, in place that you can use. Um, and the third would be to go for um, a central fiscal capacity, so essentially move from mutualized interest rates via the ECB to, um, uh, to having a fiscal capacity and um, uh, allowing national governments, therefore, um, to safeguard their uh, debt sustainability while also you know, still having an expensive um, fiscal policy to tackle all these issues that we heard about here. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see only one hand up from the floor. So you and you, and then we stop. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, David Marsh. I've got a very simple question for uh, Ignacio Visco. There seems to be a lot of spending going on at the moment in Germany. Uh, we have all kinds of off-balance sheet instruments, of, for instance, to pump another 100 billion into the German armed forces. Does this rob the Germans of their habitual moral authority to tell other countries the wise way of spending money within the Maastricht criteria? Ibrahim Barbari of City. My question, in a way, is a variant of some of the other ones that have been asked before, but it, it, it is primarily aimed at Governor Visco. When inflation was low, it seemed to be uh, that this strategic complementarity between monetary policy and fiscal policy was obvious. But I wonder whether that's still the case. Uh, and that also means whether you think, if it's not the case, whether you think uh, supporting aggregate demand at this point calls for leaning more on the fiscal side or more on the monetary side. So I'm sorry, there are also questions from our virtual participants, but um, in case uh, the panelists have seen the questions, I leave it to them in, so in uh, how they would like to take this into account. Uh, but now I give the floor first uh, to Ignacio Visco. Ignacio, five minutes each panelist. If even less, I think. No. First of all, to, to David Marsh, well, I'm, I mean, this off-balance sheet should be considered jointly with the standard um, fiscal measures. What is important, however, is that all what is spent is spent wisely. And uh, we have had a succession 
of uh, waste, and which is mostly related to, I think, uh, electoral cycles and what, what we have. I mean, the politics is very short-sighted. And at the end, uh, the long-term issues that have been mentioned, rightly mentioned uh, before, which are concerned uh, the structural changes, tend to be postponed in terms of uh, dealing with them. And, uh, and at the end, there is uh, a lot of money which is spent for current purposes. Now, some of these off-balance sheets Thank you. A, a better structure rather than the ones which are in the standard uh, balance sheet, public, public uh, sector balance sheets. The uh, issue about uh, low inflation versus high inflation and complementarity between fiscal and monetary policy. I want, well, the low inflation, I don't know, the, the, the big problem there was really the risk of deflation. I lived it that way. Uh, and I think at the end, uh, we probably uh, had to go uh, together with uh, what was the natural rate, if you want the real rate, which was very, very depressed, and having to take into account that. <clears throat> now, with uh, this high uh, inflation, uh, I think, uh, uh, notwithstanding what has been said uh, by, by Harris, I think that the difference between supply and demand is crucial here. I, I'm not advocating... Uh, uh, um, freezing uh, prices. Uh, and I think it is very important that the price signal on energy uh, is there with fossil fuels being substituted uh, over time with uh, uh, renewable energy. But uh, the, the problem here is the excess. Having had uh, the gas price uh, reaching levels uh, 20 times what it was two years ago, and even now 10 times, uh, at the end, some, something has to be done. Uh, it, you have to uh, guarantee that there is a relative price change, but you need to have a target, and governments have, ha have a target, especially in Europe, and try to reach this target smoothly rather than in this excessive way, which at the end produces uh, all, not only the supply, but also the uncertainty, uh, cumulative effects that uh, Philip mentioned. So uh, I think correctly that now we face a difficulty. And the difficulty for us is basically the second round effects. It is not, it, it, once you have this major fall in real incomes, then there will be pushes to compensate for them. And uh, uh, this is a, a, a tax. You cannot uh, reduce a tax. You can redistribute a tax. And this is the main challenge of fiscal policy. And you may redistribute between groups uh, in uh, in uh, a particular time or across time generating debt. I prefer the first one, but I think that uh, somehow we can, for short time, for a short time, really uh, try to reduce this excessive increase in energy prices and and. Uh, compensate them over time as the pressures will, uh, will fade away. That is my answer to, to the, the, the question. A f final point, uh, I, I think that the big problem of implicit versus explicit uh, coordination is crucial. Um, the lack of fiscal capacity at the European level makes it very hard to have explicit co coordination uh, or, or exchanges or confrontation. And uh, as I wrote in a paper for the OECD when I was the chief economist there more than 20 years ago, uh, the, before the central bank, the European central banks, the monetary union started, I was foreseeing major problems in the interface between a single central bank responsible for monetary policy and the multiple number of uh, fiscal authorities. At the end, the central bank could be the scapegoat. Everything that uh, is going to go wrong, it will be attributed to the central bank. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Okay, so there are many questions and I'm not sure I'll be able to, to answer all. And I see there's a question that was asked here on, on the fact, criticizing uh, the reform proposal because uh, being too complex uh, compared to, to the, the existing ones. Let me just say a word on that. Um, if you think the existing uh, rules are not complex, I mean, I'm a professor of economics and I've, uh, I, I, I just 
don't even try to uh, to uh, to explain them to uh, to my students and sometimes even to ministers and in fact this complexity not only it's a, i think it's a democratic and a, a problem but it's also uh, something that uh, in many ministries i know uh, we'd say we don't need to change the rules they are so complex that we can actually uh, you know play around them and so so i think that's an excuse the the, the existing uh, uh, complexity is an excuse not to do much uh, and in both directions actually um, so it also says that uh, it, it would be nationalistic no i don't think so uh, that's not that's not the case and it's not that permissive i mean i don't have time to go into the uh, the, the details of the proposals we make it's not permissive at all um, the debt target which is a multi-year tar debt target must be evaluated by uh, independent financial uh, fiscal institutions at the at the national level and we think that they they have to be transformed it has to be evaluated at the European level by the uh, fiscal board, by the Commission, and at the end, it has to be agreed by, by the Council. So, so I don't think they are uh, they are uh, they are uh, uh, flexible, uh, uh, very flexible, uh, from that point of view. Um, on on the the fiscal and monetary policy mix, and I understand some of the the questions going. Uh, and in some sense here, we clearly disagree with Aris. It's completely orthogonal <laughs> from that point of view. I, I would defend I'm very it. Happy with yeah, yeah. We, but be we're, we're, we've I'm been long be, friends for a long be time. Very so, and we agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, so it's true on the monetary side, it's gradual tightening that we need, even though I think we need to be careful because there's huge uncertainty. On the fiscal side, and going in, and, and I mean, trying to answer your question. Um, so, so yes, uh, uh, in the medium term, we need a fiscal policy that rebalances towards supply, towards investment, uh, digital transition, etc. Because indeed, that's what will help also in terms of the inflation in the medium term. So we need to rebalance. I'm just saying that in the very short term, we need these targeted transfers, but not as expensive and as inefficient that uh, the, the, those that uh, we've seen in my country in particular, which, by the way, is in, in an electoral uh, period. So that may explain uh, some, some of it. Um, and just to finish on this, uh, I am in favor of a central uh, fiscal capacity. But I think that the, the, the one way that we need is particularly contingent on, on Eurozone uh, white shocks, and in some sense, that's exactly what we have uh, today. So that, I think, is necessary, and that will help indeed in, in terms of explicit uh, coordination of fiscal policies. Sorry, there were many other questions, but I, I just chose some of them. So. Thank you, Alice. Uh, just a quick comment, because I'm, I'm not sure whether I find myself in a Keynesian to allied zone, or I just failed to explain uh, what I, I, I meant by the nominal income growth. Uh, so if one thinks, I mean, everybody I hope understands aggregate demand and aggregate supply. If the problem is on the supply side, then you should observe a negative correlation between real economic activity and prices. If the action comes from the demand side, then you should observe a positive correlation between inflation and real economic activity. And this is precisely what we are observing right now. Economic activity in the US is way above the trend. In the, in the European Union, it is also somewhat above the trend. So, so, this, this, so, sorry. so this, this discussion about you know, fiscal policy and who is gonna be, be supporting high levels of aggregate demand I mean, this really I don't understand because aggregate demand is already too high. This is what we see in the data, right? This is what we, and, and, and we saw some projection. I don't know whether it's Christine, who, who was, no, it was Philip Lane that had a 5.4% real GDP growth. Pencil in for, was it 2021 or 2022? Did anybody notice that? 5.4, 2022, 5.4 real GDP growth. Okay, this is what the figure showed. Okay, maybe it's lower, but if you look at nominal income, this is what the data shows. So I'm sorry, but I don't see why we should be concerning ourselves about 
fiscal and monetary stimuli when we are experiencing very high growth. Thank you. So thank you. Um, we have plans to leave questions open that you have some food for thought uh, when you go home. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank the three panelists. You have done an excellent job. Please join me. Now I hand over to the big boss. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I had prepared uh, my own position, it takes about an hour, but uh, we will do that at another time. No, uh, seriously, I think it's been uh, great, it's been fun to see you all and to have these interactions. It's a lot more fun uh, in person. Um, there are always things which can go wrong, uh, but uh, if you wait a little bit, we can make them right. So thanks a lot uh, to the team, uh, to the technical team, Mr. Lehmann, uh, technical team back there, all the people involved, uh, Mrs. Lenz. Um, uh, thank you very much also from the hotel, but also the students who are helping out. Um, it's been great. Um, it's also been nice this time. I think hopefully next year we are in a much larger setting again with everyone, but it's also been nice. It feels a little bit like ECB watchers, uh, you know, like, what, 15 years ago when we were, uh, it was easier to see everyone and to directly relate. So thanks to the team again, join me in a round of applause and hopefully see you next year.